at number 10, cutting fingernails. Each civilization had their own specific beliefs, religions, and rites. For the Vikings, their belief in Norse mythology impacted a lot of their daily lives and even their burial rituals. One specific prophecy from their religion depicted the end of the world, and as anyone would, they tried to avoid that at all costs. In Norse mythology, Ragnarok was their version of the end of the world, and during this event, it was foretold that a lot of stuff was gonna happen, like giants and demons approaching and attacking the gods, and a ship called Nagfar would carry a fleet of giants. This ship was said to be made of the fingernails and toenails of the dead, and the bigger the ship, the more giants would come. Out of fear of this happening, the Vikings took every precaution to prevent Ragnarok and subsequently the arrival of this fingernail ship. To do this, the Vikings built into their burial rites a very important step, cutting the fingernails of the dead. The Vikings had to remove the fingernails of the dead so that they couldn't be used to build the giant ship, but other than their removal, no one really knows what they did with said fingernails. The Vikings were also said to have kept their own fingernails clean as to prevent the same outcome. At number 9, teeth filing. Many civilizations had body modifications as part of their culture through time. Mesoamerican civilizations were known to shape their skulls and alter their eyes, women in China altered the shapes of their feet for many years, and so many cultures around the world adorned themselves with tattoos, piercings, and scarifications. In Viking culture, their body modifications often included dental work. Evidence suggests that some Vikings filed horizontal lines into their teeth, and some of them filled those grooves with red dye to make themselves look even more terrifying. Because the Vikings were known to be voyagers traveling the seas to new lands, some anthropologists believe that the Vikings may have picked up their idea for dental modification after making contact with people in West Africa, as many tribes over there were known to file their teeth into different shapes. Would you guys ever do something like this, or would you rather leave that up to the Vikings? Now before I continue telling you guys about the weird and crazy things that the Vikings did, let me first ask you guys to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and maybe also consider subscribing to the channel to see more awesome videos like this one. At number 8, Carbon Monoxide. The Vikings were pretty good builders, mainly of ships. Their ships were huge, intricate, and very impressive, but where they excelled in shipbuilding, they lacked in the construction of their homes and community buildings. Apparently, the longhouses that they built for their communities were actually pretty unsafe to be in and trapped a lot of toxic gases inside of them. Researchers from a university in Denmark recreated one of the Vikings longhouses and lit a fire in the center of it, like the Vikings would have done back in the day. After simulating an average living environment and monitoring the atmosphere inside of the longhouse, they realized that there wasn't enough ventilation to prevent carbon monoxide and nitrogen dioxide from building up inside. This would have led to a lot of people getting sick, especially those who spent long periods of time inside. The Vikings didn't know that though, but they also had their own remedies for curing sickness, so I don't think that they would have thought much of it. At number 7, Onion Soup. Speaking of Viking home remedies though, they had some pretty interesting ones. Every civilization had their own takes on medicine and healing their sick and injured, and the Vikings were no doubt the same. For them though, soup was their tool for healing, and for x-rays. Sort of. These days we eat soup when we're sick to warm up our bodies and balance out our sodium levels, and doctors have actually proven that eating chicken soup actually does make you feel better when you have a cold, but Vikings didn't really have the same idea. For them, onion soup was their thing, and they used it to diagnose people. Viking healers would make up a pot of really strong onion soup and feed it to a warrior who had a wound around their abdomen. Once the person drank the soup, the healer would see if they could smell the soup through the wound. If he could, then the wound was fatal and there was no sense in trying to save the person, so they would just move on to the next warrior. It saved the healer time trying to attend to everyone, but it kinda sucked for the person who got left behind, because not only are they not going to make it, but their last meal was that awful onion soup. At number 6, Blood Eagle. We all know that the Vikings were a ruthless group of people, but their methods of execution really painted a clear picture of how terrifying these guys were, and how they had a colorful imagination when it came to to imagining new ways to unalive somebody. The Vikings came up with a method of execution called the Blood Eagle, and yes, it is just as terrifying as you would expect with a name like that. The Blood Eagle basically involved cutting someone up to make it look like an eagle. They would cut apart the rib cage and then spread it apart to make it look like wings, and then after that, while this person was still alive, mind you, they would pour a salt solution over the wound, pull out the lungs, and arrange them over the rib cage to, again, make it look like wings so that this person could flutter away into the afterlife. 
Now the mysterious part of all this is that historians aren't exactly sure if this was actually a real method of execution or if it was just embellished in Viking records to make them sound cooler. I for one hope that it wasn't actually real because that sounds brutal, but when it comes to Vikings, you never really know. At number 5, building fires. The Vikings were some pretty innovative people, but they were also kinda gross. This gross behavior applied to a lot of things, but one of those things was their fire building. Now you're probably asking yourself, Bree, what's so gross about making a fire? Well, it's the way that they started the fire that was kinda grody. You see, nowadays we have a bunch of things that we can use to start a fire. We have matches, lighters, lighter fluid, and a bunch of other things. But obviously back in the days of the Vikings, they didn't have those fire starting tools, and so they had to improvise. The Vikings came up with a nifty little trick to start a fire where they took a fungus called touchwood and they would beat it and burn it until it turned into a thin flat thing that kind of looked like felt. Then they decided to get gross and would then boil the touchwood in human urine because urine contains sodium nitrate which would help the touchwood turn into something that would smolder rather than burn. They could then take this stuff with them and use it to start fires whenever they wanted so they could cook food over their urine fueled fire. Sounds delightful. At number 4, conning. Conning people has been something that's kind of been part of many societies since probably the dawn of civilization. Anyone can con anyone into doing anything or buying anything. I mean, people do it on eBay all the time. But apparently, the Vikings were also known to con people probably for their own enjoyment, because they're Vikings. Back in the day, the Vikings would do trades with the Inuit people and they would acquire narwhal tusks from them. The Vikings would then sell those tusks to other people, marketing them as unicorn horns, and let's face it, no one's gonna turn down buying a unicorn horn. Because of the Vikings and their conning ways, by the Middle Ages, people not only believed that unicorns were actually real, but that they also had magical powers. So in a way, if you were obsessed with unicorns as a kid, you can thank the Vikings for that. At number 3, house bears. Humans seem to be pretty good at domesticating animals. We domesticated dogs by accident and now they're considered man's best friend. We domesticated livestock for food and other purposes. We domesticated horses to be our transportation and carry things. So we kind of know our way around animals and could probably make anything into our pet if we really wanted to. But the Vikings weren't just satisfied with dogs, horses, and livestock. They were the mighty Vikings and they needed mighty pets, and that's why they kept bears as their companions. Yes, bears. Now don't get me wrong, the Vikings also had normal pets like dogs and cats, and they would even sometimes bring them along on their expeditions, but they also really liked bears. It is said that when they weren't out laying siege to someone's town or sailing the seas, the Vikings would visit bear dens and take bear cubs home with them. They would then raise the cubs as house bears. But having a house bear was also a very big responsibility. You had to make sure that your bear was kept in check at all times, so that meant no eating people or livestock, no disturbing your neighbors, and if your bear did get into trouble, you would either get hit with a fine or be banned from having a house bear. So maybe it's best to stick with normal pets like dogs. At number 2, worthy kids. The Vikings were ruthless even when it came to their spawn. I mean their kids. These guys were really picky when it came to having a family because they weren't afraid to just yeet their kids if they didn't like them enough. Back in their day when a baby was born, they would christen their kid with a name during a ceremony called Asavatni, but only after determining if this kid was even worth raising in the first place. You see, when a baby was delivered, the child would be placed on the ground for the father to then pick up and examine. He would be looking for any physical deformities, disabilities, and to determine if the kid was actually his or not. He would decide if the kid had a future. If they did, then they would hold the Asavatni ceremony where water was sprinkled on the kid's head and given a name, and if they weren't worth then they would be left outside in the elements and abandoned. And finally at number 1, criminal profiling. It turns out that the Vikings kind of invented criminal profiling. You see, when the Viking horde would set off to battle, there was no telling how they would return. You have to remember that these guys were bloodthirsty and violent and there was no telling what was going on in their heads. I mean, don't even get me started on the whole berserker rage thing because that itself is very intense. But basically, when the Horde would return home, they seemed to have caused a lot of problems because many of them couldn't turn off their rage and would just wreak havoc on the town. To deal with this, it is said that a series of Icelandic sagas were written as a sort of profile to warn the homegrown Vikings of what to look out for when the others would return. 
They had to kind of alter their stories a little bit because if they were too specific, then it would have caused people to learn to be afraid of basically any Viking man. So they had to keep things a little generic, but for the most part, people learned to stay away from those who couldn't turn off the berserker rage at home in order to keep themselves and the rest of their community safe. At number 10, non-stop party. What is the longest amount of time you've gone out to party? A couple hours, maybe a weekend? Well, I don't think it could ever compare to how long the Vikings partied. The Vikings would have probably had a good old chuckle if they knew our parties only lasted a few hours. They'd be like, ha, look at these weaklings. Anyway, these guys could probably out party anyone. Their biggest festivities, like the ones held after large expeditions or for weddings, would typically last for days, but their major feasts, like the ones they would use to celebrate the winter solstice, may have lasted upwards of 12 days. Now that's a lot of party stamina. I would probably need about 50 Red Bulls to even try and keep up with these Vikings. Number nine, actual really good food. Like pretty decent food. If you're a foodie, then I do have some good news for you. The Vikings were apparently like pretty decent cooks. For the time anyways. They stocked their parties with roasted meats like poultry, horse, and beef with platters of greens, fruits, and buttered vegetables. Beer, ale, mead, and fruit wines were the common beverages and heavy drinking was encouraged. Not unlike bars today where there's always that one person who keeps secretly buying tequila shots for everybody and then you're like okay fine I'll take it because I don't want to be rude, you know what I mean? Anyways, considering the fact that parties would sometimes last for weeks on end, having a lot of food in their party hut was super important. They needed enough to last them until the partying was done, which who knows when that would be. At number 8, rap battles. Every party has to have some kind of activity, right? I mean, yeah, we can all stand around listening to music and kicking it up, but it's way more fun to have activities to participate in, right? Well, the Vikings certainly knew how to throw a party because they had their collection of party activities to choose from, and it sounded kind of like a hoot and a half until we get to the other parts of this list and, you know, just throw that out the window. They would set up games like dice and chess, or at least their early Viking version of chess, and even board games. The Vikings also had this super fun fun drinking game called Flighting, where partygoers would team up and recite poetry. They would drop some sick bars about their conquests and exploits, and would even drop a diss or two at their opponents. Like a Drake versus Kanye moment. Oh, wait, no, they're friends now. Damn. Well, scratch that last part, but you know what I mean. On top of rap battles and board games, Viking parties just wouldn't be a proper event without drinking, and they even played a game to see who could drink the most. Honestly, I kind of feel bad for the Vikings' livers after all that, and imagine that hangover. Yikes. Number seven, vicious tunes. Ever had a neighbor who would decide to throw a banger on like a weekday? Or have a roommate who thinks they are really good at guitar and wants to like prove it 24 seven? They're like, wow! At like 4 a.m. Yeah, it sucks. If you don't enjoy scenarios similar to this, then you would not want to live next door to a Viking encampment. These folks rocked out really hard and for, as we know, a long period of time. They loved live music, as do I, and archaeologists have recovered flutes, hornpipes, and stringed instruments from settlements. But as most of the singers were well into the mead, according to Arab travelers, they weren't easy on the ears? Like picture the moment Bohemian Rhapsody comes on in a bar and the screeches sounds everyone makes as they try to say Galileo like really loud. My voice is dead. That would be awful. One account described their singing comparable to the calls of wild animals. <laughs> oh boy, that's, that's rough. But sometimes they would switch it up with some poetry as mentioned by skilled artists called Scalds. At number 6, full send or no send. It seems like the Vikings lived by the notion full send or no send because man, the things get wild and crazy at their parties. There was no holding back with these guys. Oh no. I know I previously mentioned some of the activities that the Vikings would have at their parties, but those ones were the tame ones. And if you know the Vikings, they can't have PG friendly shindigs. Of course not. There's gotta be scenes of violence and coarse language. Viewer discretion is advised. Other than playing chess and having rap battles, they also had mass casualties. They played games where people literally kicked the bucket, but I guess dying at a party this wild is a good enough way to go. Some of their more dangerous party activities included throwing leftover bones at one another with the deliberate intent of inflicting bodily harm. They also played a 
full contact bat and ball game that would often end in injury or the big sleep. And they also held a swimming contest. But there wasn't that much actual swimming involved since the point of the game was to hold their opponent underwater for as long as possible. I would have to imagine that these so called games would just make for a vicious cycle because they'd celebrate something, play these games, kill someone, and then the funeral will have them celebrating again just to do it all over again. What a wild life these Vikings lived. Number five, drunk sword fighting and other things. Imagine letting a two year old hold a very sharp broadsword. Sounds like a bad idea, right? Well, nobody seemed to think so when they put swords in the hands of drunk vikings, which let's be honest, that's pretty much what a two year old is, is essentially like a drunk person walking around. Outdoors, vikings constantly wanted to one up each other on the strength meter. They had weight lifting competitions, who could lift the heaviest stones, they wrestled, held archery contests, and of course sword fighting competitions, as well as all the games Bree mentioned above. Were they sober? Probably not. They also had a game called Togo Honk, which was kind of like tug of war. Men would sit on the ground facing one another, press their feet together, and bend their knees. The goal was to try to straighten your opponent's legs and flip him over. Honestly? That sounds like a blast. Do you think it's a smart idea to put a sword in a drunk guy's hand? No, but it was the Viking era. There were literally no rules except for a few. At number four, not enough chairs. Now we know that these Viking celebrations would often last for days on end, right? So imagine if during all that time you couldn't sit anywhere comfortable. Sounds pretty unfortunate, but it was the reality of a lot of Viking parties. Because these gatherings were so big, hundreds of people would be in attendance, but unfortunately there wouldn't be enough space to sit. To to try and accommodate their hundreds of guests, Vikings would break out their longest tables and benches, but usually this still wasn't enough space for everyone, so it became kind of a rule that only the most important people were allowed to sit. Chairs are thought to have been pretty rare, so the most powerful and wealthiest Vikings were allowed to sit in chairs. Everyone else had to fend for themselves, either sitting on uncomfortable benches or just standing around. Now doing this for a couple of hours, no problem. For a two week celebration, you can count me the heck out. If my tush she's not comfortable, I'm going home. Number three, fertility celebrations. So we talked a lot about what Vikings actually did back then and how they partied. Uh, they partied pretty hard. But now we're talking about what kind of festivals they had. This holiday is celebrated on April 30th in Finland, Sweden, and Germany, but goes all the way back to the Vikings. This night is called Waluburgas Night, or Waluburgas Night, or I probably said it wrong, but let me know. And is named after a woman called Valborg. She was born in 710, somewhere in Dorset slash Wessex, as the niece of St. Boniface. She traveled with her brothers to Württemberg, Germany and became a nun. She lived in a convent of Heidenheim and became renowned for her healing powers and was canonized as a saint after she died. This celebration is in honor of her, however it was originally a pagan celebration called Beltane, a celebration of the return of summer. Viking fertility celebrations took place in and around April 30th and due to Valborg claiming this date as well, the two celebrations became one and the same eventually. Viking fertility celebrations usually involved sex sacrificing an animal or two of some kind, and included all of the above. At number two, harvest slash winter night celebration. Next up in celebrations to mark on your calendar, we have the harvest slash winter night that took place on October 31st. It can also be referred to as elf blessing, dis blessing, or fray blessing. Kind of like our spooky tradition today, it was a time of honoring the ancestral spirits, spirits of the land, the vanir, along with the powers of fruitfulness, wisdom, and of course, death. A little brutal, yet kind of merciful in a way, the animals who weren't going to be able to make it through the winter were smoked or made into sausage. It was often led by the women of the household. They left the last sheep in the field as an offering to Odin, though this varies. It also marks the start of something called the wild hunt. The roads and fields became territory of ghosts and trolls and marks the beginning of the darkest and coldest time of the year. The festivities and feasts are particularly joyous and they mainly aim to celebrate kinship, accomplishments, and the tales of the year. Last but not least, Yule. This last one is perfect for the season we are entering and a great way to end the list. The festival of Yule was, slash kind of still is, a celebration of 12 days. It was the most important of all Norse holidays and began on the night of December 20th. The god Ingvi Freyr rides over the earth on the back of his shining boar, bringing light and love back into the world. Later, Christianity influenced things, changing the god to Baldur, then Jesus who said to be reborn at the festival. For the Vikings, Yule signified the beginning and end of all things, taking place at the darkest time of the year. Children were said to leave their boots outside filled with hay and sugar for the gods journey and in return they would receive a little present. 
Sound familiar? On top of that, the celebration would include drinking, feasting, songs, games, banquets, and sacrifices to the gods and the ancestor spirits for the 12 days. They even had what was called a Yule tree, which inspired the use of the Christmas tree today. Number 10. Patterns. Yeah, I don't know about you guys, but I'm starting to notice a pattern. What's that pattern exactly? Well, I'm starting to notice that maybe other Europeans were nicer than at least mainlander ones. I'll get into it. Was Vikings giving their women's rights messed up? No, of course not. I'm not a monster. However, you just gotta understand that a lot of other women in Europe did not share these privileges, like owning property, marriage rights, they even had the right to be warriors. While only a small fraction of women were involved, there are a couple sources that refer to female warriors, such as the war maidens. Now, mind you, Vikings were coastal raiders, not so much a professional army, but still, it's about the freedoms, so you slay on, Valkyrie warrior, slay on. Number 9. Marriage Okay, well, there was more freedom, but let's be honest, this was a long time ago and not 2022, so not everything was perfect. The marriages were oftentimes arranged by both families and watched over by elders. What's the average age of a bride-to-be, you ask? Well, the bride is a little bit older, and some might call it a midlife crisis, but she's getting married at the age of 13. Lucky number. Sadly, this is just how it went for many civilizations of the day. I'll make the joke again that you don't have that long to live back then, so sure, it makes sense, I guess. Just looking back through the lens of time just makes my skin want to crawl when you do the ugh, yucky. I'll stick to the coastal raiding and the pillaging, thanks. Number 8. Grooms, Tombs, and Drogers Ladies, wasn't your wedding night beautiful, surrounded by friends and family, a nice meal, and if you've been married long enough, maybe even some bad hair and tuxedos that went out of fashion the second you walked off the altar all while being recorded on the first camcorders that were big enough to be bazookas. God, I miss the 70s and 80s. Well, Vikings had some weird things going on too. No, not those bright blue tuxedos. I never understood how that was in style. It was just really weird. Vikings had this tradition where the groom would raid his family's tomb and retrieve a ceremonial weapon. Afterwards, he would take a very hot bath and sweat out the scent of the tomb, I guess? I'm not really sure. Where then his hair was stylized and somewhere a symbol of four was placed on him. I don't know about you guys, but that sounds like a lot. I prefer our tradition of drinking too much in the sun before the wedding starts and falling over at the altar. That's a much better one. Number 7. Blood Ladies, if your husband's dungeon crawling wasn't enough to creep you out, then the poor Viking women had more strange traditions for you. The Gothi, or basically a Viking priest, who makes the wedding happen would often sacrifice an animal in front of the whole wedding to prove that he was capable of commencing a wedding, pouring blood on himself and oftentimes spraying the newlyweds as it was seen as good for some strange reason. For immediate family, you might want to sit back as you're in the splash zone. And because this is the time before well-taught and understood sanitation, I'm sure there was a grand feast afterwards. I'm sure that won't make anyone sick, right? Number 6. Quiet Time You might be thinking to yourself, okay Big Chad, having blood sprayed on me at my wedding is kind of messed up. But you haven't made your chief joke yet. Does that mean there's something worse than impersonating 1976 Carrie at our wedding? Well, yes, yes there is, and actually I'm glad you asked. So, when two people fall in love and get married, and maybe have a little bit too much champagne, they go home to put on the final signatures of the marriage, if you catch my drift. Two young lovers dancing the devil's dance in the bedroom sheets for the first time because everybody waits until marriage. However, for Viking women, there's a tradition that us today would be mostly uncomfortable with. Or, I mean, at least if you don't have an OnlyFans, maybe not, I don't, I, I don't know. But when the young couple went back to do what young couples do, they had witnesses. Oh yeah, that's right, at least six witnesses apparently, just to make sure things go over smoothly. I moseyed on into town the other day and uh, you know what the chief said? That ain't it. Number five, housewife. Ladies, I hear you. No woman wants to be told by a man to cook, clean, and be a housewife. But for Viking wives, this was half the case. Not so much misogynistic as it was just really a necessity. While a lot of Viking life was more than naval raids and pillaging, and while women warriors most likely took part in said pillaging, the women in Viking civilizations did a lot of work at home. Cooking, making clothes, and a whole list of duties that I know I could never do. Truth of the matter is, Vikings were big burly fighters and still required the tender care of a woman. All patriarchy aside, imagine how hard life would have been back then without one another. 
As for today, I don't think you understand how hard it would be for me personally to sew a hole in my own clothes. Many of underwear have been lost to me not being able to sew so long underwear. Number four, score! I heard you work with the companions. What do you do, fetch the mead? That's a Skyrim reference for anyone that's not sure what that is. It should come as no surprise to anyone that the Vikings enjoyed a little drinky poo once in a while, and by that I mean all the time. Famous for their beers, meads, and wines, Vikings drank to drink for just about any reason, really. Alcohol played a big role in Viking society, as did in many other civilizations of the past. However, this may have had something to do with the mistreatment of their wives. Think about it for a minute. Has your dad ever been drinking a whole case of beer in the sun on a hot summer weekend, where he then proceeded to say things that he's been thinking but needed the liquor courage to say it? And when he said these things, was it not the most nonsensical thing you ever heard? Well, I'm sure that happened to the Vikings too. Just, it was freezing cold out and the men weren't wearing a fresh pair of white sneakers for mowing the lawn, which doesn't really make any sense when you think about it. This may be why women were allowed to leave marriages if they were mistreated. Number three, divorce process. Unlike other women in Europe, Viking women had the option to opt out of their marriages. A divorce for other women in Europe may just cost them their lives. Looking at you, King Henry VIII, However, the process of divorcing is rather awkward. Not that I would know, but I feel like a divorce should be somewhat of a private matter. Unless, of course, you're 90s trailer trash and you end up on Jerry Springer. That ain't my baby. That is not my baby. But even regular folks like you and me can still have their dirty laundry out to air, especially if your marriage is property and children to decide over. While not as messy as daytime television from a forgotten era, the Vikings made their divorces rather public, as that was the divorce process itself. The woman would have to call witnesses to the married bed, or rather just the home, and declare she was divorced. Imagine being pulled off a grueling day's work to be told the lady from the other side of the village is getting divorced. I'm gonna get back to my farm, lady. Jeez. Number two. Far out, man. As if drinking copious amounts of ale and mead wasn't enough to upset a marriage, how about some recreational use of some wacky substances? Vikings were known for going in a berserker mode when in battle. A seemingly blind fit of rage that would see anyone or anything in the Vikings' way cut down without mercy. There may have been an answer for this aberrant behavior. Mushrooms. Yes, that kind. Some scientists believe that these mushrooms with mind-altering effects grew in areas not too far from the Vikings, and once discovered would lead to some interesting results. Because a large man with a very sharp axe and a belly full of beer is exactly who should be consuming the same kind of mushrooms that may or may not make Pink Floyd's album sound 10 times better. Number one, Nazi Nazi. The chief came sailing into port today and said this isn't it. That's right, I did two chief jokes today because that's how messed up this is. Viking men of the past, I'm putting you in the naughty corner, bad Vikings. See, like previously mentioned, Vikings were more than just coastal pirates. They had villages, farms, etc. Just like the rest of Europe. But alas, they did do some pillaging. Oftentimes when going on a raid, one of the many things that was taken from other civilizations and villages was women. Oh yes, not just stocks of gold and grain, but the village's women too. Where they would be taken back to the Vikings, where they would be put into YouTube's least favorite S word for um, well, you could probably guess what for. Some were married off and some were probably put to work. This is why the Vikings are going in the naughty corner. At least the women could divorce, right? Number 10, unfaithful. Viking warriors were large, strong, tough, and rough men who drank like fish and partied like it was 1999. And remember, I do. I wouldn't go as far as to call the Coastal Raiders gentlemen. Since, well, they were not gentlemen. It's fair to say that they weren't exactly so nice to their women. For example, it wasn't that uncommon for a Viking male to take a bed with his wife. It was also not uncommon for a Viking man to take a bed with someone other than his wife. Which, unless you're a collection of certain people from Utah, that's not okay. Not that I'm here to judge anyone from Utah or the Vikings, but I believe if you fall in love, you gotta stay within those boundaries of that marriage. It's just traditionally a two-person party, not four or five. Number nine, revenge. Signy was a sweet lass who unfortunately married King Seeger, a rather nasty and brutal king. He would earn his malicious title when he had Signy's family unalived, except for her and her twin brother. But wait, 
there's more. Signy then plotted revenge with her sibling by meeting up with a sorcerer who changed her appearance. She then went back to her brother where they engaged in three nights of awkwardness and shame only a family watching in force ghost form could witness. She then changed forms again to give birth to her son that would assist in her revenge. Eventually they overthrew the Mad King and set him on fire for his misdeeds, where she then also willingly walked into the fire because she felt like she was no longer fit to live. That is one wild story. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned, I guess. Number 8. Love Triangle There once was a maiden so fair and so beautiful, apparently the most beautiful and smart. Sounds like a winner to me. Gudrun was her name, and she was stuck in an unfortunate love triangle. Kajartan and Boli were friends and foster cousins. Kajartan immediately fell for the beautiful Gudrun. His father, however, did not exactly approve of this fling, as he felt she was kind of sus due to her previous marital adventures. So while holding Kajartan back, Boli went to swoon the beautiful lass. This worked. However, shortly after being distracted by a trip, Gujartan finds out that his love is now in an entanglement with his best friend Boli. This leads to a confrontation where Gujartan is struck with one blow by Boli that claims his life. Boli instantly filled with regret, the same way Anakin felt when confronting Palpatine and Mace Windu, and a what have I done sort of moment. It was awkward, but their story was a little bit easier to understand. I don't know, bad dialogue. Number 7. Volun the Smith Volun the Smith was in love with a Valkyrie, which honestly is just really cool. Come on, I mean, who gets to be in, in love with a Valkyrie? And after a brief marriage, the Valkyrie had to go back to what they do best, which is to pick up soldiers who have perished in battle. As Volund was going full Marvin's room over the grief of his loss, he was kidnapped by a king who imprisoned him to marry his daughter. The king was so serious that he had Volund's hamstrings cut so he could not escape his captivity. So to get back at the king, he slayed his two sons and fashioned a goblet with jewels made from their eyes. Knocked up the king's daughter and blew that popsicle stand. Sure, it wasn't his wife yet exactly, but she was going to be if he hadn't have turned her brothers into everyone's least favorite set of dinnerware. Take note of this one, folks. Don't do this one at home. Number six, Leif Erikson Day. Yes, the very same from SpongeBob SquarePants. Leif Erikson, the first European to land in North America. Hundreds of years before everyone's new, least favorite explorer, Christopher Columbus, discovered the Americas. A Viking man leads an expedition that honestly must have been just the worst. Sea travel just wasn't great back then. This really was a huge moment in history, one for the ages. But imagine breaking the news to his wife. Listen, honey, I know you've been hard at work cleaning and cooking and taking care of our children. And we both know I've been a great husband with all my drinking and fighting and all the mistresses I may or may not keep. So I just want you to know that I'm going to sail across the ocean for months and build a settlement in a completely different corner of the earth. Okay, bye. <laughs> See you later. Yeah, I'll write you. <laughs> Number five, Eric the Red. Probably the most infamous Viking who ever lived. And the father of Leif Erikson was Eric the Red. He earned this name most likely because of his gorgeous red hair and beard. Or it could be because he's the bloodthirsty Viking of your worst nightmares. When you think of the classic Viking, this is really what comes to mind. A drinking brute who could cleave a man in twain with a swing of his war axe. What I'm getting at is, getting bloodstains out of clothes is difficult today. But imagine what it was like back then. Yikes! Ladies, how many times has your husband come home from his blue collar job and just gotten himself into a mess? Also, take your boots off before you come into the house, dude. Come on, that's just not cool. Eric the Red most likely did the same, however, he was not covered in mustard from lunch or grease stains in the garage, but rather the fluids that can only come from separating body parts from unwilling donors. I get lightheaded just thinking about it, no thanks. Number 4. Strong Independent Woman Freydis was sister of Leif Erikson and daughter of Eric the Red. She had some strong blood in her. While not exactly Leif's wife, this story is just too messed up to not tell. This one goes to all the mothers out there. Remember your first child, remember the joys of your first pregnancy. For some lucky women, this is an easy experience, but for others, well for others it's difficult to say the least. You might notice that your body is changing and all of a sudden you're really craving food you haven't had in a long time. You may also feel a little queasy in the morning and many other little fun things that happen. Well, Freydis, the sister of Leif Erikson, went on that North American expedition with him whilst pregnant, which I can also imagine was just a beautiful pleasure cruise. However, her level of seasickness is not what's so messed up here, but rather that she had to defend herself by swinging a sword whilst very pregnant. That's a down bad woman right there. Number three, red flags. Dating can be fun. 
You get to meet new people and experience new things, mini golf, movies, maybe even some nice restaurants. However, sometimes when we go on dates, they make better stories than experiences. Sometimes people give off red flags. People who put ketchup on pizza is a red flag for me. That's that's wrong. Don't don't do that. Meet Igel Skalgrimason. No, he didn't put ketchup on pizza, but he was a mean, no good, rotten man of a Viking. But apparently was also an excellent poet. As the legends go, he got his first taste of blood when he was seven, when another young man crossed him. He then reached for his axe. You know what happens next. He grew up to be just the way you think Vikings grow up to be, and his violence carried on throughout his life. However, unlike most barbaric coastal raiders of the time, Eagle was also thought to be somewhat of a prolific writer, as his poems are considered to be some of the best from ye olde Scandinavia. Ladies, I don't have to tell you how toxic this is, right? This is a big red flag energy. Imagine getting in a brutal confrontation with him, and then he turns around and makes it into a compelling poem. Red flags all the way. No thanks. Number 2. Pay to Win Ragnar Lodbach isn't just a name that sounds like he could be a Dovahkiin from Skyrim. It's a name that struck fear into many Anglo and Franco kingdoms at the time. You never know when someone like Ragnar would show up in a boat with 30 other burly Vikings and just mess up your day royally. One royal that did not want his day being royally screwed up by Ragnar paid him to stop Vikingizing his village. Vikingizing is a word I'm going to use. Which honestly is like asking water not to be wet. Yes, water is wet, the debate starts and ends there. Perhaps Ragnar was actually close in similarities to the Dovahkiin, as I find it's easier to stop using my dragon shout when gold comes my way. Well, if he had to be paid off like a goon for hire, you could imagine how sweet and caring he was to his wives. Yeah, probably not. No. Number 1. Vikings Look, this is another broad stroke, but guys, these are Vikings, and this was ye olde Europe. Yes, women did have more freedoms than others in Viking society, but it's it's just not a good time. And honestly, if you try looking through any lens of the present into the past, you're gonna find some things you don't like. Vikings were Vikings, and unfortunately for women at the time, that just meant they got the raw end of the deal, for a multitude of reasons. Whew. Glad we live in today, not then. Number 10, bears for pets. Okay, right off the bat, let's get crazy. Some of the hardest character deaths in Game of Thrones were definitely the dire wolves. Also, spoiler alert, but also you had eight years, so. <laughs> wolves as pets sounds like something Vikings would do for sure, but more often than not, they would just have dogs and cats just like us. Few of these animals were kept as pets, really. They all had a Viking purpose. They all had the big, Cats probably had a big beard too, most likely. Viking cats belonged in the house to chase away rodents, just like they do today. Freya, the goddess of love in Norse mythology, rides in a cart that's being pulled by two cats. The cutest little cart ever. These cats were Egyptian. Most of the cats in Scandinavia came from Egypt at that time, and they adapted to a much colder climate. Viking dogs were also a thing. They were often found in graves next to human remains. So the man's best friend thing goes way back. They were hunting dogs and herding dogs, and they too followed their masters to Valhalla, hence why the bones would always be found together after death. Here's the crazy part though, Vikings would also domesticate bears from cubhood. Yeah, they would have Viking bears as pets. What a fun way to kick this list off. Number nine. Norse paganism. If you're a fan of the MCU, this, uh, this guy Thor here with the cape and the hammer and the big muscles, odds are you've heard of him before Nick Fury introduced you. Thor and Odin, they come from Norse mythology. The Aesir are the main gods of the pantheon. Those include Thor, Odin, and even Loki. And yes, in Norse mythology, they lived on Asgard. It's not just MCU stuff, one of the nine realms. So they believed that if they fought hard enough and lived the most fierce warrior lives they could, they would end up in the halls of Valhalla to join Odin in the fires of Ragnarok, the most fierce battle of all. The Vikings didn't have a name for their religion at first, so when they eventually ran into Christianity, they called it the Old Way, which just sounds cool. It's like, ah, yes, the Old Way. It's referred to today as the Asatro, and that's the worship of Norse gods. That term became popular in the 19th century, so it came much later. There was a Nordic religion society in Denmark that had around 600 members, and that was back in 1997, so pretty recently, and it was approved officially in 2003. Believers now can mostly be found throughout Denmark, Sweden, Norway, and Iceland. Number eight, horned helmets. Okay, when you think of Vikings, you probably imagine a very large man in a big ass beard with some horns. You got a horn to blow on, a horn to drink wine out of or something, or some ale, and then two horns here on your helmet. Just the horniest fella. Well, aside from looking cool, they would have. Well, aside from looking cool, this horned helmet would have served absolutely no purpose to a warrior in combat. 
I don't know, unless there's a guy out there just headbutting all of his opponents individually, I don't know. The horned helmets were only introduced into Norse culture when costume designer Carl Emil Doppler made them for Norse themed operas in the 19th century. So it's really just modern art that we're thinking of. Also, Thor surely doesn't help. He has like wings on his helmet. I'm like, is that real or is that just Chris Hemsworth? I can't tell the difference. Number seven, hockey. I had to share this one, you know, being a Canadian and all, this one hurt. We found out that hockey wasn't our thing during Canada's 150th celebration. How epic is that? Oops, timing. I'm cold a lot of the time. My face hurts here in Canada. It hurts when I walk to the store and get my weird bagged milk and then I return back to my igloo. You know how it is. That's the idea, right? That Canadians are cold and they play hockey all the time. Well, honestly, yeah, pretty much. Not too far off. Well, hockey isn't just our favorite winter activity. Vikings loved it too. They actually brought it here in the first place, believe it or not. They didn't call it hockey also. They called it a way better name. They called it slap and fatten, which means to slap the fat around. You slap some fat with a stick. Me and the boys are gonna go around and do some road slap and fatten. <laughs> Car, heads up, pause the slap and fatten. Let's get out of here. Vikings would get sticks and try and slap some fat in between two posts. Imagine getting cross checked by a Viking. See you later, chest plate. Number six, what's that smell? You would think that just looking at a Viking that they would probably smell bad. I don't know, they're by the sea a lot, they're always damp, there's lots of hair. I mean, the beards alone probably suck up 1% of the ocean, barnacles and all that jazz. But believe it or not, these Vikings didn't smell bad. They were actually known for their hygiene. When excavations were done and all these sites that Vikings lived at, well, rather raided and then lived at, ancient hygiene tools were found. So like tweezers, combs, ear cleaners, they were into it. They weren't lucky enough to have Q-tips back then, so instead they used animal bones, which wouldn't hurt too much. Your eyes wouldn't really roll for that one, I don't think. It's just business, no pleasure. Vikings would bathe once a week, which to us sounds like a risky move, but once a week for that time period, that's amazing, that's unheard of. Queen Elizabeth I would only bathe once a month. So put that in comparison. Mind you, when you're hauling gear throughout a forest and then you have to use your ax for four hours straight, you might sweat a little bit more than the queen. Number five, the first raid. The first official Viking raid took place in 793 AD. These Viking raiders left such a huge mark on history that we refer to this time period as an age. Just like the Middle Ages, we have the Viking Age. It officially lasted from 793 to 1066, the year of the last big Viking battle. I said I'll get into that later on. I didn't, I just talked about hockey and slap fatten. Departing from agrarian pagan Scandinavia, settlers and traders rolled up to England and they arrived in Lidensfarn, and then from then on they just invaded hundreds of settlements. Now English kings were ruling over coastal areas at the time and they needed to start making defense plans from all these seagoing pagans that everybody's now talking about. Imagine hearing about pirate vikings, I'd be like, what, who are these, they have what, beards and axes? Number four, Viking funerals. Now, I know this isn't messed up per se, but I really wish that we still did Viking funerals. They would be way more fun, I don't know, instead of carrying that 900 pound casket down that aisle for like 14 city blocks, Vikings would do it in one of two ways, and both were pretty epic to witness, I'm sure. One way, they would bury the body, the classic, right? They would leave stone circles around the shallow graves that they dug, or do these burial mounds, or grave fields, usually after a battle. Vikings were pagan, they believed that the more smoke there was during a cremation, the better. The smoke was their way of reaching the afterlife. Boats also symbolized safe passageway to the afterlife in Norse mythology, so Vikings would shape these stones around the grave like a ship or a boat. But high-ranking Norsemen, they would be buried with their boats. In 834 AD, the Osberg ship burial honored two women, and this ship vessel was massive. It was 70 feet long and 17 feet wide, had 15 oars on each side. It was discovered in Norway on a farm, so the whole shooting an arrow while they're at sea thing, that sadly wasn't common. It wasn't a thing at all, really. Because if you missed, you just gave away the Osberg and you botched the funeral. Way to go. I know, sorry, I know. Number three, hit the slopes. Vikings didn't invent skiing by any means, but they did make it cooler. The name skiing actually comes from an old Norse term that means to stride on skis, and Viking would hunt on these skis. They got so good at hunting down elk on these skis that a law had to be written in order to protect them from going extinct. That's how good they got. The Gulathing Law of 1274, it was written in Norway, and it outlaws the hunting of elk while on skis. You probably read that and you're like, who the, what? Skiing was such a big advancement for Vikings that there's two Norse gods involved in the sport. We have Ullr, the god of snow, and Skadi. Imagine these two showing up in the next Thor movie. Game over, man, take my money. Number two, rap battles. 
I'm currently in the middle of Netflix Rhythm and Flow series. It's a great time, I'm loving it. It's like American Idol, but for rap. Like, hi, that's amazing. Rap battles today are nuts. They're crazy, they're intimate. Rap battles today are so impressive, but imagine getting schooled by a Viking. Yeah, you heard me. Imagine a Viking battling you and then just destroying everything that you care about after destroying you with words. You got a twofer. During those olden days, you needed a way to pass time. If you couldn't play hockey or slap fatten, and there weren't any villages to destroy, you always had poetry. Fighting comes from the Old Norse term flyta, which means provocation. Insult exchange, but make it theater. Norse literature really has tales of their gods fighting. Imagine the next season of Loki and he's battling Freya. I'm like, come on, he's got this. It's hometown advantage. It wasn't to see who can diss the other's hometown the hardest, really, per se. This is actually a challenge in order to see who can spontaneously think of a poetic retort. In Anglo-Saxon England, flighting would go down during a great feast, enjoying roast while watching a roast. We love it. This was entertainment in the 15th and 16th century Scotland. Now we have, well, this. We just have me ranting about flighting. If you like it, give it a thumbs up. I'm doing my best. And finally, number one, go berserk. Whenever you're playing a video game or like Assassin's Creed Valhalla per se, that health bar at the top starts to glow and you're ready. For a brief second, you can go beast mode and then everyone can hit you with arrows and nothing happens, right? You go berserk. Most games have this in some way, but did you know berserkers were a real thing in history? Just like Thor and Loki and everything else, apparently? Those Norse warriors would arrive to the battle decked out in bearskins. The term means to change form. So these guys were considered a higher power when it came to these battles. So you gotta call in the big dogs, or as they were described back then, mad dogs. They could take an opponent down with just one hit, and today, we have an idea of what may have helped the fight. The odds that the guys were on something, be it mushrooms, maybe they were hammered, are pretty high. Pun intended. Number 10. Weddings. When we look back on history, the traditions of marriages generally stand out as unique ways to peer into the lives of ancient civilizations. With the Vikings, marriages were generally done as ways to join houses through blood ties, which were rarely romantic. Traditionally held on Friday, the day of Freya, goddess of fertility, the couple was separated to go through separate rituals. The bride would take a bath and all also remove the Kronsen, which symbolized her status as a woman who was unwed and store it for her future daughter. The groom would then go and break into his ancestors' tomb and steal their stuff, uh, usually their swords. During the ceremony, rings and family swords would be exchanged, and a feast would be had in their honor. During this, one tradition was to stab their swords into a pillar. The deeper the sword went, the better their marriage would be and the more children they'd have. Number 9. Teeth Painting When exhuming the many skeletons of Vikings that have passed throughout history, a remarkable detail was found throughout all of them. Notches of varying size, depth, and length were found to have been cut into the teeth of these ancient warriors. The reason for their existence was something of a mystery. Furthermore, comparing the style to historical Vikings, the name of the Danish king Harold Bluetooth suggests that his title may have been slightly more literal than initially thought. This would have been achieved through the application of a mixture of resins and dyes, though whether or not it was permanent would be hard to know for sure, since the evidence has long since rotted away. Number 8. Blonde Hair The image of the Viking as a blonde-haired, blue-eyed warrior is prolific and also wrong. While the majority of Vikings were observed to be blonde and described as such, this was actually due to an extremely early application of hair dye. That being said, this wasn't solely due to fashion, though blonde hair was considerably valued in Viking society. The method in which Vikings dyed their hair was through the use of lye, which contains potassium. Potassium can often strip the pigmentation off of hair, and if Vikings washed frequently, which they actually did, they were weirdly hygienic, then it would lead to their hair gradually being dyed blonde. A side effect of this was that lye was also extremely toxic to lice, which helped prevent outbreaks on ships. Number 7. Torches. Moving straight from hygiene to… 
whatever this is. Starting a fire is extremely hard. You'll see two guys rubbing sticks together in the movies and suddenly fire appears, but you know what? That doesn't work at all. The conditions for friction alone being enough to start a fire have to be absolutely perfect. The right temperature, the right humidity, the dryness, all of it. So this is why people decided to find other methods for starting fires such as flint, a material that is fairly easy to find wherever you go. But with flint you also need tinder, and this is where it gets a little weird. It always gets weird with tinder. The vikings had a particular species of mushroom that they'd use for their torches, which they would carefully prepare and then boil in their own urine. Well, Because, and it's honestly more likely that they found this out through trial and error, they probably didn't actually know the chemicals and all this, urine contains sodium nitrate, which burns real good, as it's a chemical neighbor of potassium nitrate, which is found in gunpowder. This was actually a fairly common technique for creating torches at the time, and you know, just really cool. If not like, you know, really weird. Number 6. The 81 Yule Offerings Christmas is coming, and if you're a viking, that usually isn't a great thing. Not because of the Norse gods or anything, vikings were actually pretty quick to pick up Christianity, but more because Christmas was the time where a pretty brutal ritual would take place. Specifically referred to as Yule, the ritual was estimated to have been in honor of family members that had passed away, and generally involved singing, dancing, and killing 81 men to offer their heads to the gods. Merry Christmas! Number 5. How to Ward Off Draugr Draugr, for those who didn't play Skyrim, are a viking denomination of the undead. It's presumed as a certainty that when a person is buried in the ground, they will rise from the dead as a draugr. From there, they'll attack people, and everyone will generally have a bad time until the draugr is killed via decapitation, dismemberment, or any act of making it just not move anymore. To prevent this from happening in the first place, Viking land burials were done extremely carefully. Straw would be placed under the body and scissors would be laying on the chest, while their toes were sewn together and nails were pushed through their feet. They would then deconstruct a portion of the house and take take the corpse out through it, reconstructing it later, as Draugr were believed to follow the path back from their place of burial. They would then be entombed, and all of the items they'd owned that remained in their house would be turned upside down until their grave was magically sealed. Number 4. Berserkers a denomination of shamans, berserkers were warriors trained to fight and channel various spirits into their body. There were three schools of berserker, the wolf, boar, and bear, each one serving a slightly different role. To train, these berserkers were sent out into the wilderness to become more in tune with nature, and also drive themselves insane in the process. This would supposedly imbue them with the strengths of their respective school of combat, and so when they were called upon to enter into Norse conflicts, they were supposedly given the ability to transform into their respective animal, ripping the opposing warriors to shreds. This account is shared both by Vikings and the victims of Vikings, though it is more than likely that this is just an exaggeration meant to imply the bestial behavior of a berserker when in a trance. Number 3. The Blood Eagle. This one is not for the faint of heart. A ritualistic form of execution, the Blood Eagle is an extremely violent method of dispatching enemies which is described in the sagas. For a long period of time, these were thought to have been fictional, but as recent bodies have been unearthed that appear to have been victims of the Blood Eagle, there seems to be more truth to this than initially thought. The Blood Eagle involves the victim being laid on their front and a knife being used to separate their ribs from their spine. The spine is then removed and their lungs are spread out in the form of crimson wings, creating the eponymous Blood Eagle. Number 2. The Bloat the bloat was set as a ritual that would occur once every season at four set intervals in a year. 
but another could be organized if circumstances required it. The most well-recorded bloat was one performed by Sigurd Hakonson. Detailed by Snorri Sturluson in the saga of Hack on the Good, this ritual involved a massive amount of human and animal sacrifices, as well as sacrifices of weaponry. Blood was also collected and splattered on the walls, altars, and participants. A feast would then be had, and toasts would be made, first to the gods, and then to the fallen. Number 1. Viking Chief Cremation Ceremonies We've all heard of Viking cremations, how they load their dead bro onto the ship and sail it out into the ocean, sending a flaming arrow into it so that they might be buried at sea. However, if it was a chief that died, things would get a little bit more screwed up and nasty. First off, one of the chief's girls would then volunteer, or be volunteered, to join the chief in the afterlife. She would then be made to get mad drunk, and then would be made to sleep with every single man in the village. Seriously. She would then be strangled, stabbed, and loaded onto the boat, and the whole fire thing would go down. What can I say, except... What? Kicking off our list at number 10, stealing. Stealing today, okay, I mean, it depends what you take, and most of the time, your family doesn't end up abandoning you in the woods, right? I mean, hopefully, right? The Vikings, they didn't play around. Materials were sparse back then. It was hard to replace stolen goods, and the deed of stealing back in the Viking age had severe consequences. The Vikings believed that if you stole, you were a coward. Yeah, and I kind of agree. My bike got stolen twice growing up. Cowards? Both of them. Maybe it was the same guy, I don't know. Stealing was a different kind of low to Vikings, and I'm sure many of you can see eye to eye with this, but when you steal from somebody, they don't have a chance to defend themselves, right? There's no honor, there's no battle for land, no fight for property, no bout for glory. It's just a shameless act, right? Raiding and stealing were two very different concepts in the Viking age, because you're probably asking yourself, wait, didn't the Vikings do that horrible stuff where they stole everyone's land? They did, but it was different, apparently. They viewed both differently, although they sound the same in terms of brutality, and someone's losing their home, regardless. A stealer would be abandoned from the clan, pushing them out into the woods for around 20 years. Yeah, all because you stole a pine nut. Way to go, Eric the Dumb. Get out of here. Number nine, rodeo. Hold on to your butts for this next one. This one I did not expect, honestly. If you were an early medieval Norseman and somebody insulted your wife, first of all, how dare you? Second of all, the legal punishment afterwards it can vary, but one of the most bizarre ways to settle your beef, pun intended, was by involving a cow. Yeah, a cow. He came in, he was brought into an area, hopefully a controlled area of sorts, and that's where its tail was shaved and then covered in grease. Poor thing, had nothing to do with any of this, and now he's over here. The man's shoes were also heavily greased, and the cow was prodded to make it upset, right? Sounds like something Johnny Knoxville would do for fun, but it was not fun at all. The rodeo began when the man pulled on the cow's tail, like a bell being rung, like, here we go, gong, and then he just got whipped away. Now this, of course, would upset the cow, and it would thrash him about. Now if the man, at this point, can keep hold of the cow's tail for a specified length of time, why, he passed the test, of course, so then he was allowed to live on, and he had to keep the cow afterwards. What a weird bonding story, imagine that. Number eight, taking lives. Yeah, what happens when you do the worst of the worst? I mean, today we dish out quite the punishment, you even get a Netflix special or something like that, but back then, somebody in the Viking age? Well, it kind of wasn't a big deal. I know it sounds horrible to say, but hear me out. Back then, as long as the convicted were open and honest about the whole situation, like say, I don't know, if somebody had challenged him to a duel, why then it's fair game. One specific case from history involved a Viking man catching his wife in bed with another Viking. Not good. You don't want to catch your wife in bed with anyone, let alone a Viking. That's game over. His feet are hanging off your bed. You're like, oh, he's so large. No. That Viking man at that point could the fella in bed, but he had to bring that bloody sheet to Viking court. That would have to provide as evidence to show what happened and where and why. You know what I mean? That's simple. Today, there'd be a few more steps involved in that case, obviously. But the Viking age, this case was closed. That's it. They're like, okay, Viking law is done. Go home. 
Someone go raid a village. Number seven, hot headed. All right, here's the deal. We're doing a list on Viking punishments. So as we go on, yeah, we're gonna get darker and darker with our content. For example, one method of punishment in the later Viking age also happened to spread alongside Scandinavia's conversion to Christianity. So there are some thoughts and some actions, some questionable thoughts and actions going on in history. And this punishment was referred to as an ordeal by fire. This would involve the accused undergoing some painful exposure to heat. Maybe you drown in flames, maybe you have to eat some sort of fire or flame situation. I don't know. Either way, it was all terrible and it was very, very hot. They would have your hand put into a vat of boiling water or oil or sometimes make you walk across hot coals. And you can only imagine how creative people were getting back then, right? You don't want to know the rest. Can't even say what happened on YouTube. Use your imagination. Hit that thumbs up and use your imagination. Number six, piece by piece. Okay, what's worse than ordeal by fire? Well, probably amputation. I'd have to go with the latter for sure. That's it's close. Most definitely. In Viking societies, punishment was often dependent on status. The higher your status, the harder and longer your punishment was. High status folks got some pretty horrible stuff happening to them, honestly. If a thrall carried out a robbery at their master's command, well then it was the master that was punished. So instead of a quick death, they would amputate something. It was horrible. Yeah, continue being a royal, but now your life is going to be much harder. A real life example of such was Nut, the Danish king of England, back from 1016 to 1035. Now the king put in place a horribly grim law that thankfully died with him, but it stipulated back then that a woman committing adultery must lose her nose and ears, while men were merely chastised. Not even close to being fair at all. Now a thrall who would kill their master back then and then tried to run away were to have their arms and legs amputated afterwards. They weren't executed per se, but they could barely survive afterwards. I think I'd rather die at that point. That sounds terrible. Number five, tarring and feathering. Okay, we've all heard about this one. It's brutal, of course, but the most shocking part is how many steps this one involves. You know what I mean? Like you'd think at the feather part, one guy would be plucking like, what are we doing? This is insane. I have to go home. This is, it's been hours here. This is horrible. This one goes goes as far back as 832 AD. This disgusting act has been going down for quite a while. Again, it's so many steps. This is horrible. Who invented this? A man stealing on trade journeys was to be tarred and feathered. This was for stealing during journeys. Again, this is what I'm saying about steps here. First, you'd have to shave this Viking's head, which I don't know if you've seen a Viking recently, but that's gonna take a minute. A lot of hair, sure. Then said Viking was covered in tar and then duck feathers chucked on top. Then as if it couldn't get much worse, this poor guy covered in feathers and tar was forced to run between two lines of the men that he lived with and stole from. Now at that point, these other guys would throw stones, bricks, anything painful, you name it. Now anybody caught not throwing an object at the feathery fellow was liable to be fined. So I know it sucks, but grab something and grab it quick. If the thief did make it through this line alive, again, after being tarred and feathered, then he was off the hook from there on out. Then he was... I guess innocent? I don't know, that's horrible. I, I wouldn't make that, no way. Number four, trial by ordeal. Quite the ordeal indeed. Look, I mentioned ordeal by fire earlier and that's quite a hot mess, but trial by ordeal is, I have no words. Humans are so stupid, honestly. Introduced after Christianity, wild. Trial by ordeal was used as a test to determine whether someone was innocent or guilty. And yeah, spoiler alert, it was in fact not foolproof at all. In fact, it made absolutely zero sense at all. Basically, the accused would be placed into the center of everybody, and then they would have severe pain inflicted upon them in a multitude of ways. Like, they all just beat this person up. It was horrible, to say the least. If they survived all this pain, they were innocent. And if they didn't, then they were guilty. Who thought, like, who wrote the rule book on this? That doesn't make any sense. What kind of insanity is going on here? But wait, it gets even better. If their wounds were clean and without infection after three days, then they would be found innocent because it was a sign that the gods had intervened to show their innocence. So yeah, a lot of steps to be proven innocent. And healing apparently is one of them. Who knew? Number three, no insults. Yeah, the YouTube comments section could take a, a note from this one. Here we go. No insults. Be nice. This one's pretty good. This would change the game today. If you hurled insults at somebody back in the Viking age, well, they were entitled to compensation. And they could summon everybody else who's around at the time to be a witness. Yeah, they could be like, hey, you hurt my feelings. Give me $10. I guess that is happening today, but on a much larger scale. Comedians, really. If you spoke bad about somebody during the Viking age, even if the person wasn't there, it could ruin their reputation, right? And because of that, you need to pay them for the possible damages. Again, we see this happen today in some way, shape, or form. It doesn't even matter if the insult was true either. It's, it's too late, right? You spoke it, now it's out there. 
you did it. Your reputation was how you gained employment, met friends. It was a really important thing back then, more important than now. Can't be messed with, especially if you're a Viking. Yeah, no way. Also, if you insulted one man, you insulted his entire family as well. You know, the whole Viking rule. There were some words, however, where a man would be allowed to kill you if you said them to him. So yeah, choose wisely, I guess, with your insults. Number two, rap battles. Before we get to our big bad number one spot on today's list, we have to mention the best part of Viking tradition, in my humble opinion. Battles, but with words, not with our fists, with our emotions. Flighting, or rap battles, or my favorite part of history, I would have killed it, honestly. I was writing some before lunch, and I think I'm okay. During those days, you needed ways to pass time, right? If you couldn't play hockey, and there weren't any villages to destroy, what does a Viking do? Why, you have loud poetry, that's what you do. Flighting comes from the old Norse flyta, meaning provocation. It's basically insult exchange, but make it theater. Now it's just... ASAP Rocky. Norse literature really has tales of their gods flighting. Imagine that. Imagine how cool that would be. Imagine the next season of Loki and he's battling Freya in some sort of rap circle, some cipher. That'd be amazing. The whole purpose here was not to see who could diss the other's hometown the hardest, but rather this was a challenge in order to see who can spontaneously think of a poetic retort. It's all brains and no brawn. A little different than traditional Viking battles, right? In Anglo-Saxon England, flighting would go down during a great feast. Imagine that. You'd enjoy a roast while watching a roast in real life. Double the roast, double the fun. Later, this was of course entertainment in the 15th and 16th centuries in Scotland. But don't get it twisted, Viking flighting got pretty intense. And finally, number one, the blood eagle. The best slash worst for last. Here we go. This was a ritual method of execution that was detailed in late skaldic poetry. Again, if you're eating food right now, maybe give it a break for a minute. I don't know, giving you a heads up. In the two instances where this horrible punishment was mentioned, the victims, historically, who both happened to be members of the royal family, they were both in the prone position, right? So they would lie flat on their tummies, then they would have their ribs severed from their spine using a sharp tool, then they had their lungs pulled out through the opening to create this sort of like, um, what do you, wings, I guess. Just like a nice lungy pair of wings. We love a creative Viking, I guess. Now, both instances where this insane punishment is said to have went down, historically, both of them were accused of killing their own fathers, so. I don't know what was going on back then or who's doing what, but got some daddy issues that are not being handled well at all. So don't do that, I guess. Don't do any part of that at any time. Again, how many steps goes into lunging somebody? I can barely carve a pumpkin in one go. You know what I mean? My wrist gets tired. I can't do that. That's a lot of work. Number 10 is suspicious hygiene. Well, at least it was suspicious to others. But to the Scandinavians and their Vikings, it was actually incredibly common and important. They had a weekly resume for their cleaning their bodies or the cleaning of their clothes. This is where the the unsettling part does come in though. See, in traditional Nordic beliefs, it is suggested that since you never knew the day of your death, you should always look your best for the inevitable arrival in the afterlife. This is because when you die, you will be in the presence of your gods and any soul that has departed before you. So by dressing and grooming yourself daily in a clean manner, you ensure that you would not have to be ashamed. And it also had cosmic significance in maintaining order and staving off the cataclysm of Ragnarok, which would end the world. So to break that down, they were hygienic because however they died is how they would meet their gods, looking like that. And also, it would help prevent an apocalypse. Okay. So, the Viking reputation for being well-groomed comes from Christian accounts condemning such behavior as vain and posturing, which seduced Christians into emulating their evil pagan ways and doing so angered the Christian god. In reality, chroniclers were just pissed that the Vikings were kicking their asses and stealing their women. A famous example of this resentment towards Viking superiority and, well, hygiene is after some Vikings did a sacking of a monastery in 793, scholar Alcuin wrote multiple letters to English kings denouncing those Christians who had begun dressing and caring for themselves as the pagan Vikings did, since this obviously incurred God's wrath. What you give is whatever you get with number 9, blot sacrifices. The concept of this ritual is an exchange. By sacrificing to the gods with certain items or certain requests, the Vikings could receive something in return. Sometimes it would be a request for fertility or goodwill regarding the weather or the harvest. Sometimes it was luck in battle. It's believed that there are four of these blots that were done during the year at the time of the autumn and spring equinox and the summer and winter solstices. One of the few documented blots in history is documented by Icelander named Snorri in the early 1200s, who described how all the farmers of the area had gathered at the temple to make sacrifice, and a meal was provided by Sigurd Hakenson, a generous man of wealth. Multiple animals were 
sacrificed primarily horses, and the blood was collected all in bowls, being that the participants used twigs to splatter the blood along the stone altars, walls, and the participants themselves. Then they cooked the meat via boiling in cauldrons and blessed it by a god's priest, and then some was eaten by all in attendance. Beer was also blessed, then consumed with it. They would make a toast to Odin and decree to the king and victory before emptying cups for Njord and Frege to secure a prosperous and peaceful future. After all was done, they made final toast to their kin who had now been resting in burial mounds. Number 8 is worshipping whites. So Nordic history is sadly lost because of how Christianity colonized the country. When they invaded, they didn't just erase history, they actually buried it. So cultural hubs and temples were made of wood and they were torn down and burned on the spot. Then on their exact foundations, new wooden churches were built. Those were later torn down or fell from natural elements, and new stone churches were built on those foundations. When those crumbled, they buried history even further beneath the foundation. During this Christianization, the missionaries were more focused on suppressing the belief of named gods like Thor, Odin, Frigga, you get the idea. But smaller collectives of deities got to continue on without awareness of Christian authorities for a little. This is why we have some paper documentation of the worship of whites. Whites were protective deities on areas of land, and there were many religious rules for how to deal with them to avoid conflicts. It's debated what whites are fully. Some say they are undead ghosts or they're nature spirits. What's agreed upon is their claim as land protectors. They are tied to the landscape, often to a certain rock or a mountain or even a valley itself. When Egil Skallagrimson was driven from Norway to exile in Iceland, he decided to piss off some rights in revenge. He erected a nithing pool on white land to frighten and enrage them, bringing all of Norway bad luck. It said Iceland is protected by four of these whites and they have taken the form of a bull, eagle, dragon and giant that will kill or decimate any invaders attempting to approach. They are depicted on Iceland's coat of arms. Pisser get off the pot is number 7. Like the ancient Greeks, the Vikings also had a portable and creative fire that they equipped towards enemies. Unlike Greek fire, which still remains unexplained, we figured this one out. And I'm sure you can guess what it is from the title. I have no idea what they were doing or trying to accomplish, but when Vikings boiled a bunch of urine with a piece of tree bark fungus called touchwood together for days on end, that fungus could then be pounded flat into a strip of like felt material. Then these pieces of material could be ignited and literally tossed around. Again, no idea how they came across this combination or why they were boiling it in the first place. All we know is that this is what they figured out. Anyways, these urine saturated strips were flammable due to the sodium nitrate in urine. Paired with the spores in the mold, they created a smolder effect instead of an inferno. So they were quite convenient for setting campfires or portable fuel for cooking rigs. Either way, the Vikings carried piss grenades and I think that's pretty wild. Number 6 makes me cringe, it's tooth modification. As forementioned, Vikings cared a lot about their appearances, bleaching hair, combing beards, herbs in the armpits, ironing clothes with rocks, and apparently modifying their teeth. What do I mean by modification? Well, prepare to flinch like crazy because archaeologists have found multiple Viking skulls where there are intentional shape changes to teeth or grooves, dots, and other patterns carved into them. It's primarily been the top front teeth and researchers believe that the grooves were filled with dyes like reds and purples. Due to the Christianization I previously described, there are no records explaining this practice and it's unknown to us until we even discovered these skulls with modifications. There is some assumption that maybe it was earned or associated with a level of status, perhaps even used by warriors to incite fear in their opposition. What we do know is this practice was not seen anywhere else in the Caucasus and European regions at that time and further information just remains lost. Gather around the Yule log for number 5, Yule itself. That fun little YouTube video a lot of people put on their TV whilst opening presents Christmas morning is actually its own holiday. Yule is a period between winter solstice and the blot ritual done for that solstice. It's speculated to be somewhere around January 12th each year. The reason it's celebrated once again is lost to history, but speculation is, is that it honours the dead, the new year, and to celebrate Thor and the coming sunlight he brought as days become longer. We know that there's a multi-day feast and alcohol paired with singing and games. Vikings would make a sun wheel that they would set on fire and roll down a hill in honour of the sun's return. Sounding like a party to me. Naturally, they made yule logs decorated with yews, hollies, and firs alongside carved runes. A piece of this yule was kept every year until the next yule to protect the family and be the start of the first fire of next year. Yule is actually the basis for most Christmas traditions. The yule log, decorating a Christmas tree, ornaments, caroling, making cookies, so much more. This is actually because when Christianity was forcing its way in, they needed to up conversion. 
but no one was interested in monotheism. So they created Christmas and they used the Yule traditions as a basis in order to convince people to convert. They also took St. Nicholas and the concept of stockings, which were boots originally, from Eastern Europe and the Balkan region to convert them. Clever Christians used people's pre-existing cultures under a new name to have them join them for a lot of different things. What they didn't take however was the unsettling detail that every ninth year of Yule, it was customary for Swedish kings to sacrifice men at the temple of Uppsala. Nine heads would be offered to the gods with the bodies hanging out of the temple's sacred grove. This would go on for nine days, totaling 81 sacrifices that would be accompanied by feasts and Yule festivities. Number four is Zombie Avoidance 101. A suspicious amount of cultures speak of the undead creatures rising at night to torment the living that can't enter a door without being invited. It makes you wonder what they saw that we didn't. Called Draugr, Gans and Vikings lived on the assumption once any corpse was buried, it would become animated again. If it were peaceful, then it was called a hog boy, and it would re innocently reside in its grave to protect it from robbers. However, when they weren't peaceful, they were Draugr, wandering away from its burrow to harm any human it could find. Precautions to avoid this included pieces of straw placed in cross formations under the burial shroud, a pair of open scissors placed across the chest, the big toes tied together, and even nails poked into the bottom of feet to make walking out impossible. Even how the coffin bearers would stop before leaving with the coffin, raising it three times in different directions would symbolize a cross. Since Vikings believed the dead could only return the same way that they came, it was believed that the deceased wouldn't be able to enter a house without invitation and a body carried out feet first wouldn't properly see the route back from its burial mound. Once the deceased was out those doors, any jars, saucepans, cauldrons, chairs, clothes, anything used by the deceased that others would later be using was turned upside down. Number three is the baby trials. And yeah, I literally mean a baby going through trials. Like, don't get me wrong, it's not the Olympics, the baby didn't have to like throw a spear or man a viking ship, but they did have to be accepted and acknowledged as a real person. Norse didn't consider babies as humans the second they are born. This may seem strange to us now, but that mentality likely spared immeasurable grief as natural mortality was so high. By having emotional distance, parents were able to protect themselves, an important perspective to remember. With a happy, healthy, and alive baby, the Norse went through a few rituals to humanize it. First, the baby was sat on the ground until the father picked up the child and placed him inside his coat or cloak. This symbolized the father accepted that the baby was his child. Next, they inspected the child to ensure it was healthy. Blindness or deafness wasn't detested, by the way. After those two acceptances, the ceremony of Asavatni occurred and they sprinkled fresh water on the baby. The last step was Nathnasti, a naming ritual. The father would state the child's name and bestow a gift, usually things like a ring, farmland, weapon, or even deer. This final acceptance made the baby officially a person, and any offense towards it would be penalized as if the baby was an adult. Number two is all kinds of ghastly, the blood eagle. The TV show Vikings brought this torture method to widespread attention. You've likely also seen it in TV show NBC Hannibal or the horror movie Midsommar, a Scandinavian based film. It's a method of execution that could last hours and sometimes days, and it was rumored to have killed King Alea in 867 AD. The punished was laid face down, restrained with his arms and legs spread, and an eagle was carved into the skin of his back before the skin was peeled back and ribs separated from the spinal cord with an axe. But we aren't done yet. The ribs and muscles are then pulled outwards to represent the wings of an eagle. And of course, salt was then pressed and rubbed into the wound. While the victim is still alive, his lungs are gently lifted out of the body to rest on the stretched out rib bones. As the victim died, his last breaths and the wind amongst him would make the lungs flutter like that of a bird's wing. Jesus, I don't even know how to follow that up with a witty comment, man. I think I'm gonna just move on to the next segment. So number one is somehow more grotesque. It's the berserkers. We all know Vikings were absolute beasts in battle, so you had to know this list was gonna get a little darker towards the end. They had this thing called battle fury, which in recent times we have theorized to be the result of either intentional or accidental use of psychedelic and fungus. This could cause a self-induced hypnotic trance, resulting in them losing their sense of pain and conscious control of their movements. But nothing was more terrifying than a berserker. They took that battle fury and multiplied it by a hundred. They took on the appearance and behavior of either a bear or a wolf, even donning the pelt or the heads of their chosen animal. Oftentimes, that's the only garb they wore at all. Apparently, to reach this status, they lived out in the wild like their totem animal. Being stripped of humanity allowed them to take on the strength and mindset of that creature. So when they 
fought in battle, berserkers apparently used just their bare hands and teeth. And according to legend, they felt no pain and could keep fighting for hours despite any injury. They were said to have even ripped man limb from limb. Imagine going into battle in like 600 AD with an opposing army you've never seen before, and then it turns out it's a bunch of 6 foot 11 dudes in animal skins out of their minds on psychedelics and carrying 7 foot swords. Yeah. And we're kicking off this list with blot. These were blood sacrifices that were performed in order to appease the gods. Luckily, blot often refers to sacrifices of animals rather than human beings. Uh, and it was often horses or pigs that were used. But the size of the animal was in direct correlation with the level of gratitude they were showing towards the gods. The animals were placed over stone altars before being sacrificed, and their blood was collected in a bowl that would get passed around. And with each person, they would you know take a sip of the bowl. Sometimes twigs were even dipped into the bowls of blood and then shaken around at onlookers, spraying them with droplets of blood, kind of like a, a Jackson Pollock painting is what I picture. The meat of the animal was also doused in its own blood before being feasted on. This was a fairly common practice. It would take place all throughout the year, but now let's move on to a more special Viking tradition. Next up we have Viking Yule. The Viking Yule festival sounds pretty pleasant. Some of our modern uh, Christmas traditions were inspired by Yule. It feast, burn the Yule log, there was a Yule tree, again very Christmas reminiscent. Uh, they drank heavily, sounds like Christmas to me. There was one tradition though that's thankfully uh, been left out of our modern holiday celebrations. Human sacrifice. Yes, every ninth year, during uh, Yule, there would be a total of 81 human sacrifices spanning over nine days. So that's that's nine human sacrifices a day. Yes, kings would sacrifice nine men per day with their heads being offered to the gods. What a, what a way to ring in the holiday season. Ach, happy Yule, Sven. By the way, cancel all your plans because the king just told me you're getting your head cut off this afternoon. This, uh, this isn't even, you know, really all that strange. Human sacrifice has been present all throughout human history, all over the world, really. And it's, it's just kind of funny thinking about how celebratory it was here. Not something that's easy for us modern people to wrap our heads around. The various methods Vikings would use to ward off the Draugr. First off, what is a Draugr? They're uh, basically undead warriors. Zombie Vikings. Yeah, zombies. Scary enough as it is. Imagine facing off against an undead Viking. They were depicted having superhuman strength. They smelt of death and had a ghastly appearance. They would also often be, you know, depicted as blue or like dark, you know, with decay. If you've ever seen uh, the Northmen, uh, you may be familiar with the Draugr. We, we get this awesome fight with one of them. Very cool creatures in Viking folklore. So Vikings being as superstitious as they were sought to prevent the recently deceased from becoming one of these undead entities. And there were several methods they would employ. They would sometimes place a pair of scissors on the chest of the corpse. You know, they'd hide twigs in their clothing or they would drive needles into the bottom of their feet to keep the dead from walking around again. That one makes sense. That's, that's a pretty practical one. They would abandon children deemed sickly or weak. This isn't much of a surprise given that Viking culture was so heavily centered on strength. Vikings were a warrior culture, constantly engaged in battle, so children that were too small or sick were just really of no use. The most common method of ridding themselves of the weak was to just chuck them into the sea or take them deep into the forest where they'd be left to fend for themselves, often freezing to death or becoming a wolf pack's next meal. They didn't just do this in order to maintain a strong society though. Vikings also lived in a very harsh climate where you know those that were unable to contribute were just really extra mouths to feed. They were a bit of a burden. So yeah, different times. This is also a practice not unique to Vikings though. Another famous group of warriors, the Spartans, dispose of unhealthy children. So yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm glad we live in 2023. Vikings actually dyed their hair. Yes, uh, as it turns out, that classic image a lot of us have of Vikings in our minds is having long blonde hair and beards. It's not just a myth. I mean, I guess, you know, nobody ever thought the blonde hair thing was a myth necessarily. Many Nordic people have blonde hair, of course, but that super extra blonde look really was a thing. The beauty standards in Viking culture called for blonde hair. So for those that didn't have it naturally or just wanted to get it extra blonde, they would have, you know, actually, they would, they would actually use a uh, specific type of soap that was heavily. 
heavily concentrated and contained high amounts of lye, which we still use today to make stuff like glass cleaner and uh, fertilizer, actually. This would basically strip their hair of its natural color. They were basically kind of like bleaching their hair, really. It also do the same things uh, to their beards, which, oh my god, I can only imagine how dried out that would have made them. Beards, I mean, you gotta, you gotta moisturize these things, you know? The, the hair is very different. I bleached my hair before and it gets super stiff. It's almost like hay at first, so they must have had some extra crispy beards. Speaking of cosmetics though, let's talk about Viking's teeth for a moment. Having nice teeth, it's a sign of attractiveness, good health, but these ancient warriors would modify their teeth for reasons that aren't 100% confirmed, but we can speculate that it was to make them appear more fierce, because uh, I don't think Vikings were all too concerned with pretty, other than their gorgeous blonde locks. Skeletal remains of ancient Norsemen had been dug up in Sweden and in parts of Denmark with horizontal grooves kind of carved and cut into the front of their teeth. For the most part, they were just horizontal lines, but uh, there had been other shapes uh, found as well. Again, it's not 100% known why some of them did this, but it's said that maybe they dyed the grooves to create kind of cool lines on their teeth, almost like tattoos. It would have been extremely uh, painful, as you can probably imagine. Nobody likes going to the dentist. And it wasn't super common, but it was definitely a bit of an ancient Swedish trend. There are plenty of cultures all around the world that would also do something similar to this, but Vikings are the only known culture in medieval Europe to have practiced it. Next on the list, we have swords and what's There are several traditions held at Viking weddings that are rather familiar. The bride and groom would exchange rings, they would celebrate with a feast, there would be animal sacrifices, all pretty standard. But unsurprisingly, swords also played a major role in Viking weddings because of course they did. First of all, the groom's buddies would hide a sword in the grave of one of their ancestors, which the groom would then have to find and retrieve, kind of like a, a sword scavenger hunt pretty fun. If I ever got married, I, I might want to incorporate that somehow. And then when it came to the actual wedding ceremony, the bride and groom would exchange rings, yawn, but they would also exchange swords. These swords would have been passed down through their family and the exchange of the blades symbolized the union of the two families that were now there to protect one another. It's actually quite a lovely idea, really. The Viking funeral. We've all seen this one in movies and shows before. It's that classic ritual where a warrior or king is sent out on his ship and burned at sea. There's a, a common misconception that this is pretty much how all Viking funerals took place, but this was really more reserved for higher ranking members of society as ships were expensive and, you know, kind of important to people who would like raid villages and travel around the world. But the first step was to prepare the body of the deceased. It would be washed, dressed in its best clothes, and adorned with jewelry and other belongings. It was then placed on a wooden boat. The boat was filled with the deceased's possessions, weapons, food, sometimes even livestock, or even a sacrificed slave. Family members would often place personal items and offerings in the boat as well. Once everything was set though, the body was taken to the funeral site. The boat was then set ablaze, either by a torch or a flaming arrow, and then the flames of course, would consume the boat and the possessions of the deceased, releasing the soul of the departed to the afterlife. The Vikings believed the higher the flames, the better the chances of the deceased's successful journey into the afterlife. So family members would often add oil or other flammable liquids to the fire to ensure a bigger, you know, brighter blaze. And you know, why not? I mean, if I'm going to go, I'm going to go out as you know, a big a fire as possible. You know, go out with a blaze of glory. The Blood Eagle. All right, this one is pretty gruesome, so uh, fair warning. It seems as though Vikings could get pretty creative with their methods of torture. The blood eagle was a nasty practice in which the unlucky recipient is restrained, lying face down on the ground. Then the image of an eagle with its wings spread out was carved into the victim's back. Already sounds awful, but nowhere near finished. Typically using an ax, each of the victim's ribs were then separated from their spine and kind of like splayed out. So in the end, they'd have almost this, this appearance of wings coming out of their back. Pretty creative, hence, hence, hence the name. Hold on though, still not done. Sometimes if they were feeling extra feisty, they'd even rub salt into the wound at this point by literally rubbing salt into the open wound. And just to top it all off, the lungs were then pulled out and splayed over the exposed ribs, which would then kind of flutter in the wind like a, like a 
bird's wings. Vikings would often perform this horrific ritual on their worst enemies or even members of their own uh, society who had been deemed dishonorable. So yeah, living in the Viking Age would have been uh, even more brutal than you may have thought. It's not a hundred percent known, once again, if this ever actually happened or if it was more of a tall tale, but I don't know. I, I wouldn't be surprised. It was really a thing. People can be, people can be pretty messed up even nowadays, so you can only imagine what people were, were up to back then. And coming in at first place is the practice of awaking one's berserker power. Berserkers are not just a thing of myth. These barbaric warriors were really said to have existed, and the method of becoming a berserker was pretty brutal. They would undergo a process of kind of death and rebirth, stripping themselves of their humanity to live in the wilderness as the animal they represented. There are kind of three types of berserkers that are kind of known to have existed. Uh, there are wolf kind of ones, bear ones, some kind of took on the appearance of a boar. It would hunt like animals, raid villages with a ruthless animalistic fury. For their battles, they would enter into this almost trance-like state after performing dances and howling and roaring at the sky. They often fought completely naked too, which would also be, imagine just an army of big naked men roaring like animals rushing in from the forest to raid your village. Berserkers just evoke such awesome imagery. And it's no wonder they're some of the most iconic uh, warriors in history.